All right, so um, today we will uh, talk about group equivariant uh, convolutional networks, which will um, apply all the group and representation theory that we learned yesterday uh, to build neural networks, uh, which are operating on signals on Euclidean spaces. And uh, they do it in such a way that they commute with uh, symmetry group actions. I think this clicker doesn't work. Check. Okay, now it does. So it's a very short uh, motivation uh, where we could apply it. Um, here are some examples of uh, feature, feature fields, uh, we call them, on uh, Euclidean spaces. So for instance, uh, in one dimension, you could have an audio signal. Um, in two dimensions, on the bottom right, uh, you could have uh, some image, image processing. Um, or in three dimensions, uh, a brain scan. And uh, we usually use uh, convolutional networks, which are translation equivariant, which means that um, if you shift uh, your image around, then also your responses shift. And uh, the neural networks, which have these properties, convolutional networks, they uh, generalize what they learned between different spatial positions. But uh, if you are looking at um, this example here in the bottom right, this uh, microscopy image, um, where you should segment the cell boundaries, which are highlighted in green, then uh, you see that the cell boundaries don't only appear at different positions uh, in the image, but also um, in different rotations or different reflections. And uh, we are interested in generalizing this um, equivariant property from near translations to other symmetries like uh, rotations or reflections. And uh, for audio, for instance, uh, people use models which are um, equivariant to scale transformations, uh, which corresponds to changing the pitch of your sound. Um, in the beginning, I will uh, first uh, have a very short intro on uh, MLPs, multi-layer perceptrons, which are kind of the um, standard archetypal uh, neural network architectures. And uh, we will think about how you can uh, use them to do image processing and uh, why they are not desirable to do that. Um, and then uh, convolutional networks are kind of resolving this uh, up to a certain extent. So this is uh, the second part, translation equivariant uh, CNNs. And uh, then we generalize uh, what we learned um, in designing translation equivariant CNNs uh, to more general affine symmetry groups uh, of Euclidean spaces. And uh, in the end, I will shortly talk about uh, some, some type of architecture, which is called a group convolution. Um, and that is a very special case of uh, our steerable CNNs. And I will highlight uh, how these two things relate to each other since uh, people know both theories, but uh, we didn't really well explain yet how they relate to each other. So a multi-layer perceptron um, is often claimed to be a universal function approximator between two um, finite dimensional vector spaces. So you can learn any map uh, from Rn to Rm. And um, yeah, so for instance here, what you see in this image is uh, a map which goes from R3 to R2 in the end, uh, and you could use it, for instance, to um, classify uh, such uh, such uh, flowers here, uh, which have uh, three features as input, the length, uh, the width, and the thickness of um, the leaves. And uh, then you want to classify uh, for probabilities that this thing is either in species A or in species B. So we can throw in any number of features, n features, and we can get m responses out. And uh, these neural networks are built in such a way that um, these, these layers, which you here see, uh, they are kind of uh, affine maps. So um, to get from R3 to R4, you would apply a weight matrix, which is a, a four times three matrix. And then you would uh, sum a bias vector, which is four dimensional to it. Uh, this is an affine transformation. And uh, you could chain these transformations. But uh, if you compose affine transformations, you will again get one affine transformation. So um, in between, we need to apply nonlinearities, uh, which you're seeing on the top right. For instance, this uh, sigmoid in red or the ReLU nonlinearity in blue. And uh, this way, you can build these uh, universal function approximators. And then you optimize the parameters w and b to um, yeah, fit whatever you want to fit. And in principle, we could apply this uh, to classify images as well. Since if you have an image like here from this MNIST data set, it has uh, 28 times 28 pixels. So you have 28 squared uh, numbers, and you can interpret such an image as a vector in R to the power 28 squared. So it's a very long vector. 
which you can just throw into an MLP, and then you can classify these images into being uh, one of the classes from zero to nine. But uh, the problem is that um, these MLPs don't generalize uh, over geometric transformations, since uh, if you, for instance, translate your image or if you rotate it, then you get some uh, permutation of all these uh, entries in the vector. And uh, multi-layer perceptrons do not generalize over these uh, geometric transformations. And it's even worse. You could uh, take your whole data set and uh, permute all the pixels in it. If you do it in the same way for uh, the whole data set, then uh, this is completely equivalent. The multi-layer perceptron does not know about pixel location. So it doesn't know anything about the uh, topology of the underlying space. It's uh, completely ignorant of the geometry. And uh, what people use instead are convolutional networks. And uh, you can view them as basically being MLPs with an additional um, inductive bias, which is equivariance. And uh, yeah, so to process an uh, image, what, what you see here in the beginning, you could have a multi-layer perceptron, which takes each pixel as an input. And uh, then in the first hidden layer, you have uh, this vector of activations, and each uh, single neuron is connected to all pixels in the input. This is what I showed before, if you have just a standard MLP. And then we can have certain inductive biases to optimize this architecture. The first one is uh, having a local connectivity, so uh, each neuron in the hidden layer is only connected to some local set uh, in your in your input image and uh, this gives the um, hidden layer activations kind of the same topology like your input space and uh, this is also what we are seeing um, in our biological retina we also have a local connectivity there but this doesn't give you equivariance uh, yet and if you want to have a uh, translation equivariant architecture you need to have weight sharing so um, if, if you just have a locally connected network, you could apply a different kernel, or it wouldn't be a kernel, but you, you could have a different neural connectivity at each point. But if you share this neural connectivity between different points, um, you get this property that if you shift your input image, then the features go somewhere else. But at this other point, you have the same neural connectivity, so you will get the same response at another point. So by weight sharing, we get uh, translation equivariance. And if we want to have something like uh, yeah, affine group equivariance, which means that we don't only have translations, but also something like rotations or any transformation from some symmetry group G, which is a subgroup of the general linear group, then uh, we get an additional weight sharing constraint, uh, which is a constraint on the convolution kernel itself. So we still have weight sharing between different points, but the convolution kernel has to be what we call G steerable. And uh, this example here is an SO2 steerable kernel. And SO2 is the rotation group, so you get some rotational symmetry in your kernel. And this is how we build uh, steerable CNNs. And uh, yeah, I show this slide from yesterday again. So uh, if you have an equivariant architecture, or this, this would be an invariant architecture, then uh, what you get is uh, that you are guaranteed uh, to classify whole orbits in your image space as the same class. And this uh, simplifies your learning problem. Yeah, as I said yesterday as well, um, uh, feed forward networks, are you, you can view them as uh, just sequences of layers. And equivariant neural networks are sequences of equivariant layers. And if we want to design such an equivariant neural network, uh, what we are doing is uh, that we need to first specify the feature spaces and the group actions on them. So we know our symmetry group, but uh, and we know the input uh, of our network and the action on the input. We know the output space, uh, what we want to predict and how it should transform. But all the intermediate feature spaces, we need to uh, somehow define and we need to define which group actions act on them. And if we have all these spaces and group actions, then in the second step, we can look for layers which map in an equivariant way between these uh, feature spaces. And this is how we design uh, equivariant networks in general. And uh, for the case of uh, convolutional networks, the feature spaces are feature maps, and they have a translation group action on them. So they are actually a translation group representation. And uh, these uh, equivariant maps uh, would be something like convolutions or a special way of bias summation, how you do it in convolutional networks, or uh, there are also equivariant nonlinearities. Okay, to define feature maps, uh, we can first look at the discrete case, which is, uh, if you're more applied, probably better known to you. So if you have a discretized feature map on, on a Euclidean space RD, 
then uh, this is usually implemented as such a tensor, uh, which has the shape uh, x1 to xd. These are your d spatial dimensions. So uh, if you have an image, you would have a certain width and height. And if it's volumetric, you also have a depth of pixels or voxels in that case. And then on your last axis, uh, you have feature channels. So what this does is kind of uh, for each spatial position, for each voxel, it attaches a c-dimensional feature vector. So if we want to have this in continuous space, uh, we just have a function which uh, maps from each point in Rd to a c-dimensional feature vector. So to each point, we attach a feature vector. And um, yeah, just as a technical uh, thing, we have a vector space uh, of square integrable functions uh, from Rd to Rc. This is our vector space of feature maps. And then we uh, also need a group action on our feature space. Um, and there we have this uh, translation group action, um, which yeah, takes a translation and uh, an input feature map, and it produces an output feature map, which is just a shifted uh, version of the input feature map. And uh, we define this translation group action. So the translated feature map at point X is the original feature map at uh, X minus T. And uh, you can see that in this image here, if you have uh, some feature of the shifted feature map at X, this is just the feature value which was copied from X minus T. So this is the uh, standard translational group action on feature maps. And uh, now we see we have a vector space and this uh, group action is actually a linear group action. So uh, this defines the translation group representation. And uh, this representation is known as the regular representation of the translation group. Okay, now we have our feature spaces and our group actions, and uh, we can start thinking about how to design equivariant translation equivariant layers. And um, yeah, any translation equivariant layer is uh, a map from input feature maps, which are C in dimensional, to output feature maps, which are C out dimensional, and uh, it needs to commute uh, with this input and output uh, group action. And uh, the first result I want to show is uh, a theorem which uh, states that uh, linear equiver translation equivariant maps are convolutions. This is actually necessary. Yesterday I showed you that uh, convolutions are translation equivariant, and now we go the opposite route. We have an ansatz which we make of a linear map, and then if we demand uh, on top equivariance, we get out that this linear map has to be a convolution. So it's uh, in this sense the most general um, linear translation equivariant map. And uh, for that, uh, we first need to make an ansatz. Uh, we could, uh, for instance, take a generic integral transform mapping between these input and output feature maps. And uh, these integral transforms are parameterized by some uh, two-point correlator, which is a function kappa, which takes uh, two input points uh, in RD, and it gives you a C out times C in matrix. And uh, it's defined by this integral, which you see there. And uh, as an intuition, you can uh, think about a matrix multiplication, where if you have uh, like the entry x of, a, of the uh, multiplied matrix with the vector, this is just defined as a sum over y, m x y v y, right? And uh, if you now look back at uh, this definition of the integral transform, it's the same, only that our um, indices, matrix indices, are now kind of continuous. Um, and in this case here, we would uh, still have a yeah, a scalar kernel and a yeah, scalar vector, a vector with at each entry a scalar. But uh, we have an input uh, feature map which has multiple channels. So at each point you have a C in dimensional vector and you want to produce an output field uh, which has at each point a C out dimensional vector. So in addition, this uh, correlator has to be uh, at, at each pair of points in RD has to give you an uh, C out times C in matrix. So if we take this uh, linear map as an ansatz and then we demand equivariance, uh, we have a theorem which has uh, several statements. The first one is um, that uh, the integral transform is exactly then translation equivariant if this uh, correlator depends only on the relative distance of its two arguments. So um, we have this kappa, which depends on x and y, but uh, if we shift both x and y by the same amount, then we get exactly the same, uh, the same value or we need to get the same value, um, which means that uh, it only depends on the relative distance of X and Y. So usually you, you could take for each pair X and Y, you could have a different C out times C in matrix. Um, but now uh, we have this property that if we shift both 
uh, both x and y by the same amount, and we have the same relative distance, we need to get the same matrix. And uh, then you can uh, reduce uh, the, the information content of, of this uh, redundant two-point correlator into something which depends only on one degree of freedom, which is the relative distance. And uh, we do this by um, defining a one argument convolution kernel, uh, which is just defined as, um, yeah, so if, if we have kappa of x and y, then we can uh, always, by this first statement, uh, sum some t, some value t on both x and y. Uh, and if we take the specific choice that t is minus y, then we get that k of x and y is equal to, uh, sorry, kappa of x and y is equal to kappa of x minus y and then a zero in the second component. And uh, this thing, which only depends now on this relative distance in the first argument, can be written as uh, something which depends really only on this relative distance. So we call it k of x minus y. And this is a non-redundant description of this uh, restricted or constrained uh, two-argument correlator. And uh, if you think about it, um, yeah, I, I claim that this is convolution kernel. Maybe it looks different uh, from what you know from implementations. Um, but yeah, if you have an implementation of a kernel, usually uh, it's again a tensor which has uh, a shape x1 to xd, and then the last two axes are uh, c out and c in. And uh, as you see, this is again in the continuum something like a map from rd to c out times c in matrices. So it actually corresponds directly to what you know from PyTorch or TensorFlow. And if we take this result now and uh, have our kernel uh, k, and plug it into our integral transform. So we had here that uh, is it? kappa of x and y is equal to k of x minus y. We plug it into our integral transform ansatz. And then what comes out is that this integral transform is a convolution. So um, if you didn't completely follow, um, you can look at it later. But the key takeaway is uh, that uh, a translation equivariant linear map has to be a convolution. Um, if you're assuming that the group action is a regular representation. And um, this uh, property, which is usually called uh, translational weight sharing, uh, is something which you could also call it, uh, you could also call it translation relativity, which is the term which uh, physicists use. It's exactly the same property. Then as a second example, we can look at bias summation. And uh, then our ansatz could be that uh, we take our uh, input feature map and uh, we sum um, yeah, biases to it. And in principle, we could sum a different bias to each uh, feature vector at each location. This is the most general summation thing you can do. And uh, yeah, I call it a, a bias field summation. So you are summing a bias field with a different bias uh, B of X uh, at each spatial location. Um, but then the theorem uh, which we have here states that uh, this bias field summation operation is exactly then translation equivariant um, if this bias field is uh, position independent. So you actually need to sum the same bias at each spatial location. You cannot sum a different bias. And this is what everyone is doing with convolutional networks, but uh, yeah, without having this theorem and without having a derivation of it. And you see that it follows uh, by, by uh, demanding translation equivariance. And it makes sense since just uh, think about having, having a feature map and then at some point uh, you sum a bias uh, and now you shift the feature map, or you would first shift the feature map and then sum the bias. Uh, you want that the same comes out at a shifted position, so you need to sum the same thing at each position. And then you can uh, do the same for uh, yeah, non-linearities or pooling operations. You will always get that whatever you do has to be shared between different spatial positions. OK, so as a summary, um, we defined the feature vector spaces as uh, spaces of feature maps. Uh, then we defined the linear translation group action on the feature maps, which gives us a group representation. And uh, then we derived uh, convolutional network operations by first assuming some ansatz, some, some general family of functions, which we are interested in. Then we demand the symmetry property. And uh, we get, uh, in this case, um, weight sharing or spatial invariance or relativity constraint on our operation. And now we are going to look at uh, more complicated symmetry groups, and uh, we are following the same uh, approach. Uh, 
Yeah, as I said before, in this case here, uh, where you have such biomedical images, you're not only interested in translations, uh, but you're also interested in, uh, let's say, reflections or rotations, or maybe you want to scale your uh, image in the equivariant. Uh, you could also have shearing. Um, so the, uh, the family of symmetry groups we are considering are so-called affine groups, which are a semi-direct product of translations, and then uh, some group G, and G is a subgroup of the general linear group. Yeah. Um, um, so we, we have reflections, but uh, we, which symmetry? Uh, no, we don't consider that currently. I, I guess it's something you, you could approach in a very similar way, but uh, we didn't look at it like that, yeah. Yes, and uh, then we have these uh, affine groups and uh, they have a canonical action on Euclidean spaces. Uh, so, well, first, if you have a group element from the affine group, you can always split it up into a translation T and a group element G from this uh, subgroup capital G. And uh, it acts, so this G is, is a, since GL, D is a matrix group. Uh, this, these are D by D matrices, so uh, it acts by multiplying our position vector with uh, this D by D matrix G, which does some reflection or rotation or something like that. And then we sum uh, after that the uh, translation to it. And that's our group action. Uh, and yeah, it's visualized here on the uh, right picture, kind of pictorially what, what is going on. And uh, yeah, what, what you can see already from here is that um, the translations uh, don't have a, or they, they are not part of a stabilizer subgroup, but uh, if, if you are at some point uh, on, on your Euclidean space, then uh, G is actually the stabilizer of this affine symmetry group. So for instance, if you have rotations, then uh, the point in the center is uh, fixed. But in the symmetry group, we, we have rotations around every single point. And now we want to build uh, convolutions, which are not only translation equivariant, but equivariant with respect to these affine uh, group transformations. And um, yeah, what we need to talk about first is uh, which action do we have on the feature spaces? Since otherwise we cannot, uh, cannot derive equivariance. And um, instead of considering feature maps, uh, we consider something which we call uh, feature vector fields. And uh, they are essentially um, also functions which uh, assign C-dimensional feature vectors to each point in space. Um, but now they have an uh, affine group action instead of only a translation group action. And this affine group action uh, depends on what we call a field type, rho. And rho is just a, um, a group representation of, of this uh, point group G. And uh, to motivate that, I, I first want to show some examples. So for instance, you could look at the scalar field, which is a map from RD, from the Euclidean space, to R1. So at each point, you only have one scalar value. And uh, it transforms like, so you have an action of TG, some translation and uh, G transformation on the scalar field. At X is just S of TG inverse X. And uh, you see it here at the, this uh, bottom visualization. Uh, if you want to know the scalar value of the transformed field here uh, on the top, then you just have a look up from the scalar value somewhere else. So this is this S of TG inverse X. And uh, if you look at the tangent vector field, um, these are fun functions uh, which attach to each point in the Euclidean space, a D-dimensional feature vector. And uh, it transforms like um, the transformed field is uh, again V of TG inverse X, but then in addition to these vectors, we multiply G. And uh, if you think about it, it's, it's just like you, you have this vector here. And uh, if you rotate it up, two things happen. So this TG inverse, the spatial transformation, moves it to another point. But in addition, this vector is also rotated, right? So if you go from here to here, you end up with a vector with, which is differently rotated than our original vector. And uh, this is modeled by this G, which acts on, on the vector after it's, uh, yeah, the spatial position is changed. Yeah, and this is uh, what I'm saying here again. And uh, you also have this, uh, well, you, you always have this uh, action that you're moving feature vectors on the base space, RD, but um, then you have some G uh, transformation also on the feature vectors. And it didn't show up before in the scalar field uh, since it's a trivial representation, which we are considering here, or a trivial action, which just copies over scalar values, but does not change the scalar values themselves. <laughs> 
So um, you could think uh, here about some, some uh, scalar field like, let's say, a pressure field or a temperature field. If you rotate that, each temperature or pressure value goes to a new point, but it doesn't change. And if you have something like a uh, yeah, wind field or so, some flow field, then uh, each vector goes to a new position, but it's also rotated itself. And we can generalize this to general row feature fields, uh, which are just C-dimensional feature vectors attached to each point in the Euclidean space. And uh, they transform again like these other two fields. So you have the spatial transformation. But now we have uh, some group representation row, which is a C times C matrix acting on uh, these feature vectors at each point. And then if you take as a special case uh, the, uh, the trivial representation, you get a scalar field out. If you are taking the uh, defining representation of the group, so you're multiplying with G, then you get the tangent vector field out. Uh, but you could also build something like cotangent vector fields if you take the adjoint representation of G, or you could look at uh, tensor fields, which transform according to tensor representations. Then uh, in, in practice, people are often using irreducible representations or regular representations of the group. So like whichever group representation you can come up with uh, defines you some type of feature field. <laughs> are there questions so far? Since I think this is uh, important to understand. Yeah. Translation uh, um, in the transforming the vector itself, that you get larger if you translate. Um, so um, th this is one one definition of of a group action which you could come up with. Uh, yes, I think you could also have certain group actions which uh, act on the feature vectors themselves. Uh, but that probably even corresponds only to reshaping your your tensor and reinterpreting this thing. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I guess you you could come up with something which also transforms in the uh, kind of in the feature axis uh, if you're translating. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah and uh, again, um, this this group action is uh, linear, and um, we we have a vector space of feature fields. Uh, so this is actually an affine group representation. And it's uh, denoted as the induced representation of rho. So rho is a G representation. And uh, we get out an affine group representation. And uh, this step of, of going from this G representation rho to the affine group representation uh, is done by this functor, uh, which is the induction functor, which just yeah, lifts a representation from G to the affine group of G. Some examples, um, we could have uh, fluid flow or optical flow, which are vector fields. Um, you could also have scalar fields like temperature or pressure, or um, what's also interesting uh, in 3D, uh, people are uh, recording these uh, brain scans and then they compute something which is called a diffusion tensor image. And then you have uh, yeah, tensors uh, at every point. And uh, yeah, these would be even, uh, I think, symmetric tensors or something like that. Okay, so um, if you have a, a conventional convolutional network, you don't only consider one feature map, but you have multiple feature maps stacked on top of each other. And um, then the number of hyperparameter or the, the hyperparameter you have there is uh, that in each layer, if, if you implement in your network, you have to choose how many channels you want to have. And uh, in the same way, uh, we also um, operate on, on stacks of uh, different feature fields. And we need to choose which feature fields we have and with which multiplicity they occur. So, uh, we could have uh, in our hidden layer then something like 10 scalar fields, 20 vector fields, uh, 30 tensor fields, and you have to choose that as a user. And um, yeah, this is a direct sum operation of representation spaces, uh, which means that also your feature fields uh, transform according to a direct sum of representations. Uh, so you have this block diagonal matrix here, which means that uh, the channels of each feature field, which belong together, they transform independently from each other. So if you have a two-dimensional vector field, for instance, these two channels will mix into each other if you rotate your image. Uh, but if you have then below this uh, one-dimensional field would probably be a scalar field. Uh, and the vector field and the scalar field do not mix into each other. These are really independent features from each other. OK, some examples about such uh, stacked uh, feature fields. Um, if you have an RGB image, you have uh, three values at every point. So it's a three-dimensional feature vector field. But geometrically, you should think about it as uh, being three independent scalar fields. Since if you're rotating your RGB image, then uh, each, each uh, 
R, G, and B value goes to a new position, but these uh, color channels do not mix into each other. So the representation uh, describing that is a direct sum of uh, three trivial representations, which means we have a scale or three scalar fields. Now we can go and take uh, each color channel independently and, uh, for instance, apply a gradient operator to it. And then uh, we get out a vector field for each color channel. And uh, we can do this on the uh, non-rotated and the rotated uh, RGB image. And we get out uh, yeah, six channels. But um, yeah, if, if we look at how they transform, if we do this on the input and the output, we find out that uh, they are actually three vector fields, which is expected if you have gradients. Um, and that means that uh, these pairs of channels mix into each other. Okay, so again, we have now defined uh, our group representation spaces. And uh, now we need to look at maps which are equivalently mapping between these representation spaces. So um, yeah, we have uh, on the left uh, L2 RD RC in uh, with this induced row in group action. So uh, this is the induced representation of row in as, as input representation space. And then we have the row out induced uh, representation space and we want to look at uh, maps between them. And uh, we have again this uh, same approach that we start with a flexible ansatz. And then we demand f and group equivariance. And uh, now we don't only get spatial weight sharing, but in addition, this property, which I called G steerability, which is some form of G symmetry of, of your local operation, which you're applying. And uh, this actually comes from, so the f and group is the semi-direct product of translations and uh, yeah, G transformations. And um, the translational subgroup gives you, again, exactly the same constraint as you saw it before in standard CNNs. But now we have this additional local G stabilizer symmetry, which gives you an additional constraint on, yeah, in, in this image here, for instance, on your convolution kernels. You still have weight sharing, but the convolution kernels have this uh, rotational symmetry in this picture. And uh, we take, again, exactly the same ansatz uh, for our linear map, just this integral transform with two arguments and uh, restrict it uh, to be equivariant. And then uh, the theorem here says that this integral transform is exactly then affine group equivariant if uh, now two properties hold. The first one is, again, it has to be a convolution. And uh, I didn't expand now all these steps how to get to the convolution with this relativity of this uh, two argument kernel. But uh, this is exactly what you were seeing before. But now in addition, we have this, uh, what we call a G steerability constraint on the convolution kernel. And um, yeah, it's just uh, this constraint here, which says that uh, K of GX, this is kind of taking the kernel and then applying a spatial transformation to it. Like, uh, yeah, you could rotate your kernel spatially or so. Uh, this should be the same as uh, here on the right, K of X, so the non-rotated or non-G transformed kernel, uh, but being left and right multiplied by row in and, uh, or row out and row in inverse. And uh, this row in and row out acts uh, on the matrix components of, of the uh, convolution kernel. And uh, yeah, the transformation on the left-hand side is uh, what happens if you rotate it spatially. And I will give some examples to make that a bit more visual. And uh, to summarize it, uh, I mean, so these, these G-serial kernels uh, probably look, look a bit uh, unintuitive. Uh, but if I give you uh, G-serial kernels, then all you have to do is just uh, to take them and apply a convolution, and it will be FN group equivariant. And uh, if you're just interested in uh, applying what we are doing here, you can use our PyTorch library, ESCNN, which uh, is, is an abbreviation for uh, Euclidean Steerable CNN. Uh, this library implements these uh, G steerable kernels. So you don't have to think about uh, solving this constraint. This is all done already. Sorry. Yeah? Yes, uh, this one of the determinant uh, is a volume factor, uh, which comes from uh, if, if you are scaling uh, or shrinking your kernel. But isn't that like the, uh, the inverse of the G? Um, so here we have uh, row, row out of G and row in inverse and in the determinant, you also have the inverse. This is just how it comes out. So you you are expecting that it wouldn't be one divided by the determinant, or? But... Uh, I was trying to understand why it should work. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, um, it's it's just uh, what comes out, and and you have this constraint. Uh, it, it takes care of of uh, if you have volume changes, like if, if you would uh, shear or scale your kernel, then uh, this is the constraint which applies there. But uh, if you look at isometries or, or uh, subgroups of the orthogonal group, which would be rotations or reflections, then uh, the determinant factor drops out. Yeah. yeah. Does uh, using this volume uh, uh, adjustment imply something, meaning that we are choosing a starting value for X and then its transformations that have to be adjusted? Does it have any impact on? Um, so yes. with uh, starting value, you're, you're referring to uh, if, if you have a space on which your kernel is defined and uh, you know the value of the kernel at one point and then how it relates to other points, or what are you yeah. referring to? That factor like normalizes the kernel when G is acting on X. So mm -hmm. We have, if G is not acting on X, meaning that we're not transforming it, then that's like the starting, like the reference point yes. for the other. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, that's a very good observation. So, um, if so, uh, we, we can look at another example. Um, if, if you have uh, a rotation action on your kernel, um, and and you have this uh, symmetry constraint uh, which relates, uh, yeah, k of g x and k of x, and uh, now we are looking at SO two, so you have rotations. Then, if you know the kernel value at any point x, you will automatically know it on any point on the orbit, uh, like any point g x. So uh, yes, this this is I guess what what you said, but uh, in the radial direction uh, would be. It doesn't, doesn't matter where you start. We could have like the portrait of the Deconda completely flipped, but we wouldn't care, and that would be the starting point, and then we can Um yes. So if if you know if you know your kernel, just like if if you know your kernel on uh, on a set of orbit representatives, then uh, from there you can reconstruct your whole kernel since it has this symmetry. Uh, here for rotations, uh, also, like if, if you know, actually here I only show the angular component. So this is an example for uh, SO2. Um, but you also have a radial component of the kernel, which I don't show here to, to keep it a bit simpler. But uh, if, if you know uh, the value at one point, then uh, in this case, you see it has this uh, frequency three uh, if you go around in, in circular direction. And uh, yes, if you know your kernel value at one point, you can reconstruct it everywhere else. Yeah, very good observation. Yeah, so um, these uh, g steerable kernels, um, yeah, g steerability, or that, that's just the term that we use. Uh, it's, it's actually an act variance constraint, if you think about it, since here we have uh, in the input of k, we act with g, and then in the output of k, we act uh, with the tensor product action of row in and row out. So this is an act variance constraint. Um, yeah, and, and uh, these g steerable kernels uh, account for, for the uh, local stabilizer subgroup transformations. So uh, what happens uh, if you have your image and then you apply the kernel somewhere? Uh, we can actually now restrict tension just to the uh, field of view of the kernel and then uh, think about, okay, what happens if we transform this field of view of the kernel? Uh, for instance, if we would uh, rotate it. And um, yeah, what, what these uh, g steerable kernels uh, guarantee you is that uh, if this field of uh, view transforms uh, spatially via G, so you would try and rotate your, your field of view uh, feature field, and uh, it also transforms according to row in. So together, this means that we have the induced representation uh, acting on our field of view. And then you, you apply this kernel to the field of view at that point. Uh, if uh, you got some response out before, and then you do this uh, induced representation action on the field of view, you will get out a different response vector, which is the out dimensional and which will transform according to row out of G. And you will get that property at every single location for every single field of view. You will get out a vector which will be uh, steered according to row out. This is uh, what this uh, G steerability in your kernel guarantees you. So uh, I want to give some examples uh, for the most trivial group you can consider, since there you can uh, solve it analytically, actually. Um, and this is the reflection group. And uh, as a first observation, uh, you see already that you have uh, certain symmetries, reflectional symmetries in your kernel. And um, what you can also see in this picture is uh, that uh, what I'm showing here are well, scalar kernels. Uh, these, the, the four kernels in the uh, top left are scalar valued. But uh, actually, in general, we have uh, matrix-valued kernels. 
um, which I just uh, show here as a matrix of scalar valued kernels. And you need that if you are mapping between higher dimensional feature fields, which have multiple channels. So if C in and C out are not one dimensional, you have uh, a matrix of kernels. And uh, yeah, if we are looking at the reflection group, that's a very simple group. It has two elements, the identity, and the other element is the uh, reflection, which I just write at, as S. And uh, it is defined by the property that uh, reflecting twice is the identity again. So S squared is uh, the identity. And then we have our general uh, kernel constraint here, which we saw before. But uh, we can actually simplify it uh, for the uh, reflection group. So the first thing is that um, the determinant factor drops out since uh, reflection matrices are orthogonal. Um, then we have this uh, row in of G inverse. But uh, well, uh, for these two group elements, uh, which we have here, we have that uh, the identity inverse is again the identity. And uh, the inverse of the reflection is again the reflection, uh, since S squared equals the identity. Uh, so we can drop this determinant and this inverse. And uh, we have here also that uh, this constraint has to hold, uh, hold for all group elements in G. Uh, but we have only two group elements, and one of them is uh, trivial, so it doesn't do anything, which means uh, we have to look at this constraint actually only for uh, this reflection. So what it says then is that the reflected kernel, K of GX, has to be the original kernel left and right multiplied by row in of G, or row in of reflection, and row out of uh, reflection. And uh, in this example, we are looking at uh, three different types of uh, feature fields uh, according to three different representations. Um, we could look at the trivial representation of the uh, reflection group, which uh, here in this left column, uh, where yeah, you, you have two group elements and then the matrix values for these uh, two group elements. And uh, it's for the identity, you always get uh, identity matrices out. Um, and uh, if you have reflections, then the trivial representation also just gives you an identity matrix. So it acts by doing nothing. Then uh, we have a sign flip uh, representation, which uh, corresponds to what physicists call a pseudo scalar field. And uh, that's again a one dimensional representation, which assigns uh, the identity to the identity group element. But it multiplies with minus one if you're reflecting. So you would get out feature fields, which if you reflect them, then each pixel goes to a new position. But it also becomes negative from its value. While the scalar field is reflected, but uh, the field value does not change. And then finally, we have uh, the regular representation of the reflection group, uh, which has two channels. And uh, it's a permutation representation, which just uh, permutes or swaps your two channels if you're reflecting your image. So we have our image, which now has two channels. We reflect it. And then these two channels will also swap. And now we can look at uh, kernels, which map uh, between a given pair of input and output representation. And uh, yeah, these uh, columns in this matrix on the right are the three different uh, representations which we are considering in the input. And then uh, these three rows are the three representations in the output. And for each pair of input and output representation, we get a certain symmetry constraint on our convolution kernel, which we can derive. So we go through it now. And we have that uh, for scalar to scalar fields, we have that uh, the reflected kernel, K of SX, has to be equal to the original kernel left and right multiplied by one, so we don't do anything, which means that the reflected kernel has to be uh, exactly the same as the original kernel, which just means that uh, the kernel has to be symmetric. And this is what we are seeing in the uh, top left. You have a reflection symmetric kernel, which maps scalar fields to scalar fields. And uh, this is kind, kind of makes sense uh, intuitively. If you have a scalar field uh, and you apply this uh, symmetric kernel to it, you get out some response. And if you uh, reflect your feature field, uh, and this is a scalar field, it doesn't change uh, its value. Like, uh, yeah, there, there's no, no or it's a trivial group action on, on the channel dimension. Uh, and then uh, you have a, a symmetric kernel, so you get the exactly same response out. Then, as a second example, um, we could look for maps from scalar to sign flip fields. And then we have uh, that the reflected kernel has to be uh, now the kernel left and right multiplied by minus one. So the sign flip representation and the trivial representation on the right. So the reflected kernel has to be equal to the negative original kernel, which means it has to be anti-symmetric. And again, you can think about it uh, intuitively if you have an image, uh, which is a scalar field, and you reflect it, and then you apply some anti-symmetric uh, kernel to it, you will get out the negative response of what you had before. 
So you see that uh, these symmetries in your kernel actually uh, guarantee you that if your input is a scalar field and you apply an anti-symmetric kernel, you will get a pseudo scalar field out. And this is exactly what we wanted. Then uh, if we want to map from scalar fields to uh, regular feature fields, uh, one thing is that uh, our input is one dimensional and our output has two channels. So we have actually now a matrix of, uh, of kernels or vectors. So it's, it's a two times one matrix of kernels. And uh, we have uh, that the, these two kernels reflected have to be uh, the non-reflected matrix of kernels left and right multiplied again by the uh, representations. Uh, and this regular representation swaps these two kernels. So uh, what comes out as constraint is that the upper kernel K11 has to be equal to K21. And uh, yeah, in the second row, we see that K21 has to be equal to K11, which is again the same. So uh, as you see in this picture here in the bottom left, uh, you have two, two channels on the kernel, which are themselves not constrained, but uh, they have to be reflected copies of each other. And again, we can think about a scalar field and uh, applying this thing, we get out some response. Uh, and now if we reflect uh, the scalar field, then um, we will get the same response in the opposite uh, channel, right? So we get uh, this group action, this permutation action on our response vectors. You know, we could go through all other, other examples, for instance, going from a uh, sign flip to a scalar, we again have this one and minus one uh, multiplication. So we get an anti-symmetric uh, kernel we will get again a symmetric kernel if we map from, so from sign flip to sign flip. Then if we want to map from sign flip to regular uh, representations, we have again these two kernels, uh, but now it's not a reflected copy, but it's reflected and uh, negative. And uh, then mapping from regular to scalar fields, uh, you have such kernels of shape one times two, uh, and it's actually just the transposed version of what we had to map from trivial to uh, to uh, regular representations, uh, the same for regular to sign flip. And then uh, what's maybe a bit more interesting is uh, the one in the bottom right, which maps from regular to regular feature fields. And now we have two, two uh, channel input fields and a two channel output field. So we have a two by two matrix of kernels. And um, this constraint uh, says that K11 has to be equal to K22 and uh, K12 has to be equal to K21. And this is exactly what you see here in the bottom right. So uh, these two here are the same, but reflected versions. And these two here are the same, uh, but again, reflected relative to each other. And we have this guarantee that if our input transforms according to a regular representation, so we have a regular feature field, we apply this matrix of kernels to it, then we get two response fields out or two dimensional feature field, which is again, a regular feature field. So this was uh, something we could solve uh, very easily um, for, the, for this simple group, uh, which just has two elements. Um, but to get to a general solution, um, we can uh, make certain observations. So uh, the first one is uh, that if we are looking at general non-steerable uh, convolution kernels, they actually uh, form a vector space, right? You can take these uh, convolution kernels and you can scalar multiply them, you can sum them. And uh, you can actually check that they form a vector space. And then we have this G-steerability constraint, which is a linear constraint. And always, if you have a linear constraint on a vector space, you will get out a subspace. So again, we have a vector space of uh, G-steerable kernels. And uh, this means that uh, if we want to uh, parameterize uh, such a space of steerable kernels, all we have to do is uh, to solve for a basis of steerable kernels. And then uh, we can expand the most general G steerable kernel in terms of this basis. So uh, we have trainable weights uh, WI, and then our general kernel is just a linear combination with learned weights uh, of these basis steerable kernels. And uh, yeah, I, I included here these uh, kernel pictures uh, in the top right. Um, if, if we first think about general kernels, then uh, I said we have a vector space, and you can think about it as um, having one pixel value. Uh, for each pixel location. So it's just like a very long vector. And uh, with this constraint, we get uh, these symmetric kernels. And there we have a basis which uh, wouldn't give you an independent, uh, yeah, like for, for unconstrained kernels, you, you could go in the pixel basis, which is uh, kind of like having delta distributions as a basis. And uh, if you want to have uh, symmetric or anti-symmetric kernels or something like that, 
you can have a basis which uh, assigns, uh, let's say, a value plus one uh, to a certain pixel on the top, but then you know that you also need to have plus one at the bottom, or in the case of an anti-symmetric kernel, minus one. And then you have only half of the dimensionality uh, of, your, of your kernel space, um, which means that we are also more parameter efficient. So if you have a, a convolutional network, then you are more parameter efficient than applying a CNN, and uh, at the same time you get, uh, sorry, uh, then an MLP, at the same time, you get translation equivariance. But if we then go to uh, affine group equivariance, we get an even smaller space of possible parameters, uh, which makes it uh, possible to scale our models even further up. And at the same time, we get a symmetry uh, guarantee. So it's like uh, two times uh, free lunch in this sense. Yeah. Uh, quick question. So what's the dimension of these? Like the subspace? I suppose it yeah. depends on the dimension of the groups and on the center. Yeah, exactly. Um, if, if we describe it in the continuum, it's uh, infinite dimensional. Um, but we do some discretization of our kernels in practice. Yeah, um, yeah so for instance here, uh, if we have rotation groups, uh, then uh, you, you would have, I said uh, already, uh, responding to your question, uh, we have an independent uh, constraint on each uh, radial, yeah, on each radius, but uh, we discretize these radii, for instance. Yeah, um, yeah so, uh, we, we have actually a paper uh, which describes the general solution of uh, these GCability constraints for uh, the case of compact groups, which uh, would be unitary groups in all subgroups, or we are interested more in the uh, uh, in real vector spaces, so all subgroups of uh, orthogonal groups. And um, this, uh, yeah, this this uh, solution is actually uh, based on the observation that our g steerable kernels are actually what mathematicians uh, would call a representation operator, and it comes from quantum mechanics. Uh, and uh, yeah, maybe you heard about uh, spherical tensor operators there, or something like uh, if, if you have energy, it's a scalar operator. But if you have something like uh, momentum operators, you have uh, triples of operators: px, py, pz. And uh, this would be a vector operator. You can have tensor operators. And uh, they are described by uh, this wigner ecker theorem, which uh, we could generalize to G-steerable kernels. It's mathematically, it's uh, very similar. We have to do some additional steps, but uh, the key idea is the same. And uh, it was actually Leon Lang, uh, a master student of mine, who, uh, and he's, he's a very proficient uh, mathematician who wrote this first paper uh, formalizing this wigner ecker theorem. And uh, Gabriele wrote another paper which extends that a little bit, and um, he implemented it also in our library. So now we have all uh, orthogonal groups uh, implemented in our library. For all representations you can choose, uh, we know how to build these G-steerable kernels. And uh, yeah, I can't go into details uh, since that would take me another hour to explain this uh, wigner ecker theorem. But um, what it basically does is uh, it decomposes steerable kernels into uh, yeah, the most important thing uh, is that we have harmonics on the G orbits. And uh, this is kind of a Peter Weil decomposition. So uh, we, we have, um, if, if we have uh, functions on, on our orbits, uh, let's say on, on a circle, then uh, you, you can look at any function. Uh, and the Peter Weil decomposition uh, decomposes this space of functions into uh, irreducible subspaces. And they, uh, yeah, they contain these uh, circular harmonics here in two dimensions. So if you are um, in uh, three dimensions, uh, your orbits are spheres, and then you get these uh, spherical harmonics, which you also have in physics. And uh, yeah, so we can build any kernel uh, out of uh, certain harmonics. Uh, and then uh, there are also klebsch gordon coefficients going in. And uh, we also have something which is called an irrep endomorphism. And uh, these are actually the trainable parameters then. And uh, yeah, just like in quantum mechanics, uh, we get uh, transition rules uh, between irrep fields. So uh, you may know that in quantum mechanics, uh, you, you have a certain transition which goes from, uh, yeah, let's, let's say, uh, an orbital from a hydrogen atom to another orbital, and then you have only certain transitions which, which are allowed. And we have the same here. So uh, if, if we go, um, and that's the example for SL3. Uh, if we go from uh, a scalar field to a scalar field, which is an irrep field of order zero, then uh, we can only use uh, such spherical harmonics uh, of order zero, which are actually invariant functions. Uh, if we are going from zero to one, we can only have frequency one. If we are going from zero to two, only frequency two counts. Um, but if we are going from one to one, we can have uh, frequencies zero, one, or two, 
And uh, yeah, in general, if we are going from an input irrep field of order L to an output irrep field of uh, order capital J, then uh, we can use all spherical harmonics of orders uh, L minus J up to L plus J. And this comes from this uh, Klebsch Gordon decomposition. And this is exactly what, what you have if you, uh, if you are coupling two um, spins or two angular momenta in quantum mechanics. It's uh, the same mathematics basically going in. Yeah. So you're referring to the basis of the uh, GCable kernel space, or? Yeah, yeah. So um, our theorem tells us uh, how to build uh, a basis uh, from these harmonics uh, and Klebsch-Gordon coefficients and so on. Uh, and um, where the harmonics are already uh, an orthonormal basis on your uh, space. So that's, that's a property which you probably want to have. Um, the klebsch gordon coefficients are fixed. And then we have this uh, irrep endomorphism space. And then we again use an orthonormal basis. So what, what we get out in the end is uh, orthonormal. The only degree of freedom which you have is uh, this radial component. But uh, if you look at these rings, they are also well, more or less approximating something orthogonal. But you, you wouldn't have to do it. I mean, you can, at least theoretically, you can use any basis. But uh, our theorem guarantees that we have a complete basis of our g steerable kernel space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so for, for instance, um, you usually learn in the pixel basis if you have a standard translation equivariant CNN, right? Each pixel is learned independently, but you could also have a Fourier basis uh, for your kernels. Um, maybe that works better empirically. I didn't check it yet. Um, we, we have uh, sometimes, yeah, we have some uh, experiments where we are um, using uh, the trivial subgroup of uh, GL. So G is just the trivial group, uh, but then we are still expanding uh, our kernels, not, not in the, uh, not in the pixel basis, but uh, still as, uh, in this case, an arbitrary combination of all these circular harmonics, for instance. And uh, I think as a result, the kernels are a bit more smooth and uh, we actually get a slightly better performance out. So that might make a difference, but uh, I can't give you a systematic answer on, on, on how far, which choice would work better or worse. Yeah? Um, this is a bit related, but you know how you said that in practice, you could just be plugged in from the pixel to find that number of steps? Yes. Um, Presumably, if you're using the uh, the G12 transmission signal, so like working on three D frequencies. Yeah, exactly. And so, yeah. like in practice, how would the Clement potential actually work? Mm -hmm. uh, that depends actually uh, on the radius, since uh, you, you know the uh, sampling theorem, probably right. That you can't have too high frequencies if you have a certain uh, sampling frequency, and um, yeah. So we we have a or if you have a square pixel grid. Uh, and then you look at these rings, uh, you will have, uh, that's not a one-to-one -one relation, but somehow the number of pixels on your ring grows linearly with your radius. So um, we, we have some cutoff here, uh, yeah, in this, in this uh, angular frequency direction, and um, this cutoff gets higher with larger radii. Yeah. And then we, we just have to choose. Um, we see that uh, if, if we have a uh, too high cutoff in frequencies, then, uh, the sampling actually uh, aliases uh, low frequencies to higher ones, and then uh, you lose uh, accuracy in your uh, rotation equivariance, for instance. Um, but uh, the networks are actually quite good at uh, taking this as an inductive bias uh, to still be able to, to prefer um, rotation equivariant models. But it's also kind of a hack to, to learn around it if they don't need it. More questions? OK. All right, so much uh, regarding GCable kernels. Um, I want to come back uh, for one slide uh, to our linear maps. Uh, we had this integral transform. Um, and that was actually not the most general uh, ansatz for a linear map. 
Um, but uh, Eric, who was also a master student of mine, um, he um, proved uh, that this holds uh, for the most general linear maps. Um, and uh, they would correspond to uh, convolutions with uh, what we call a G steerable Schwarz distribution. And uh, yeah, we were interested in that actually from, we, we came from a different angle, uh, which was, um, we, we saw certain parallels between these G steerable kernels and uh, derivative operators, partial differential operators. Um, and we, we wanted to look at, okay, which partial differential operators are uh, affine group act variant. And um, yeah, he, he found out, uh, something like that. Uh, let's say you, you want to map from in 2D from a vector field to a scalar field, um, then you could use the divergence or you could use the uh, two-dimensional curl to map between these two. These are kind of the basic solutions. And then uh, to each of these basic solutions, uh, you could multiply a polynomial of uh, Laplacian operators. And this is the most general partial differential operator, uh, which is affine group act variant. And uh, we get yeah, stuff like like the divergence or curl out, uh, which which is exactly what you have in physics, since physics is of course also equivariant. And uh, yeah, so he he worked on these uh, steerable PDOs, and then uh, to to solve that uh, constraint, uh, where well, he, he found at some point that uh, you can generalize it further, and then uh, he also has a theory on on uh, Schwarz distributions, which you find in the same paper. And now we can look again at uh, bias summation as a second example uh, of equine, affine equivariant uh, maps. And uh, we take the same ansatz that we uh, sum some bias field, which first we take to be unconstrained. And uh, if we demand equivariance, we uh, get out that this bias field now does not only have to be uh, translation invariant, but affine group invariant, which means it has to be, uh, again, as, as a particular subgroup uh, translation invariant. But in addition now it has to be uh, G invariant as well. So that means that uh, the, this bias vector, which you sum to each spatial location, the shared bias uh, has to satisfy that the bias is equal to rho of G times the bias. And uh, this means actually that uh, you may only sum bias values to the uh, uh, trivial irreducible subspaces. So you can sum a bias vector to a scalar field, but you cannot uh, sum it to a vector field. And uh, yeah, then uh, what is also important uh, for neural network applications are nonlinearities. And uh, again, we get the result that they have to be spatially shared and they have to be G equivariant. Um, and which, uh, which nonlinearity you can use depends now on the field type you're considering. So for example, if you have a tangent vector field, or if, if you have a scalar field, you can just take a ReLU uh, nonlinearity that works. But if you would have a, a tangent vector field, you can't use ReLUs on the two channels independently. Since uh, let's say we have this vector one zero, then uh, you apply ReLU to, to both channels independently. And ReLU is, is a nonlinearity, which just uh, is the identity in the positive part, and it sets every negative value to zero. And now you could rotate actually not, not up here, but uh, as an example, we could uh, rotate by 180 degrees and we would get out minus one zero. If we then apply ReLU to uh, these two channels, uh, this whole vector would be killed. So you see that uh, ReLU nonlinearities are actually not uh, equivariant. And uh, in our library, you uh, have like all these options of uh, different equivariant nonlinearities uh, which you can choose from. And that's uh, still an active field of research, which one works best since uh, this affects the performance of the models a lot. And uh, Pim will later talk about, uh, yeah, more, more in detail about uh, one choice of uh, nonlinearity, or tomorrow, I guess. Okay, some empirical results. Uh, as I said, uh, we have this uh, library, which is called, well, the first version was uh, E2CNN. Um, it's now called ESCNN, uh, since we uh, generalized it from, from the Euclidean group in two dimensions to uh, general Euclidean groups. Um, you have the GitHub link on the top right. And uh, yeah, Gabriela, I want to mention, is uh, the guy who's really uh, keeping that up and extending the library, and he does uh, lots of work. Um, yeah, and uh, here, here are some code snippets. Uh, the first one is uh, how you would instantiate the convolution in native uh, PyTorch. So the uh, convolution is, is uh, implemented as an uh, object. And then you instantiate this convolution object by specifying the hyperparameters which would be a number of input channels, 
and then a number of output channels, and uh, yeah, also a kernel size, um, and then it, it uh, internally allocates memory for this uh, unconstrained convolution kernel. And uh, in our library, uh, you have to do some additional steps, uh, but it's not much. So first, uh, you have to choose a symmetry group um, and a base space on, on which you act and the group action of, of this group. So um, this is in the module uh, G spaces. And then for instance, here we have uh, R2 as a space and uh, we act on it with rotations. And this N equals eight means we have a cyclic group of order eight, which means uh, we have discrete rotations by two pi divided by eight, so multiples of 45 degrees. And um, then we need to fix uh, input and output field types for our convolution. Uh, so for instance, here we have uh, as field types uh, three times the trivial representation, which you would use if you have an RGB image. And uh, we could map to uh, 10 fields which uh, transform according to the regular representation of uh, C8. Um, but you could use any combination of fields you want to use here. And uh, then with this information, we can instantiate our convolution uh, operation. Uh, and instead of giving it a number of in and out channels, we now give the input and output field type. And then everything like solving this uh, kernel constraint and so on is done in turn. You don't have to worry about it. You can just throw that uh, operation on your feature fields and guarantees you that uh, if your input feature field transforms according to row in, then your output feature field transforms as it should. Here's some uh, demonstration of the equivariance uh, of our models. So we have a rotating input. Um, then if we uh, apply a, a randomly initialized convolution, uh, we get some output out which rotates. And if we uh, stabilize this view, so if we rotate it back uh, to a fixed, fixed reference frame, then you see that uh, it's uh, invariant, so which is exactly what we want. Um, you, you have some slight uh, deformations there, which come from numerical errors, but uh, to good approximation, uh, we get exactly what we wanted. Uh, while if you feed in this rotating input into a, a standard CNN, then the output is just uh, transforming yeah, randomly, basically. You have no guarantee whatsoever on, on what happens if you rotate your input. So you don't have this uh, act variance uh, guarantee. Then uh, an investigation of uh, the symmetry groups and the group size uh, you could use. Um, here we are considering uh, cyclic groups and dihedral groups of different orders n. So you have uh, rotations by 2 pi over n. And in the case of uh, dihedral groups, you also would, uh, would have reflections. And um, we are testing it on uh, two different uh, transformed versions of the MNIST data set. So on MNIST, you have these handwritten digits. And uh, yeah, this left plot uh, shows you MNIST with O2 transformations. So it's augmented with all rotated uh, digits and all reflected digits. And on the right, uh, I will later show um, just SO2 transformed versions. And uh, what is important here is that we imply, uh, we, we apply uh, such a G equivariant network, but in the end, uh, it is uh, mapping to scalar fields and gets uh, G invariant. Uh, and that will come, you, you will see the uh, effect of that in, in the right plot with SO2. Uh, but we can observe, what, what we can observe uh, for now is uh, first that we get a decreasing classification error for uh, larger symmetry groups. So uh, here we have our test error and uh, we have the different order N. So up to here we have a higher, or to, to the right, we get a higher uh, rotational symmetry. Then this uh, purple line at the top is uh, the performance of a just translation equivariant CNN. Um, and then if we only have rotation equivariance, you see that uh, the performance increases and uh, at some point it just saturates. And uh, if we have the dihedral group equivariance uh, for n equals zero, we have uh, only reflection equivariance. And that already helps a lot since uh, we have, uh, yeah, also this reflection augmentation in our data set in MNIST O2. Uh, and then it also increases with more rotation equivariance and uh, it works better than the um, just rotation equivariant model. Um, and then we can look at the same uh, for the SO2 augmented MNIST data set. And uh, well, all the models, uh, almost all the models perform better, um, also the CNN. But uh, what is interesting is that this uh, DN equivariant model or DN invariant model uh, does actually not change in, in um, its uh, performance. And the reason for that is that, um, well, if it's invariant under reflections, uh, it can anyways not distinguish between reflected and non-reflected digits. So if we have now a data set without reflections in it, uh, you, you have too much invariance, kind of. So 
uh, you can't distinguish it anymore, so the performance is not as good as if you have only rotation uh, act variance, which is this uh, blue curve. But um, we are also building models which are dn equivariant, and then in the last step, we just uh, restrict it uh, to cn, to a cn uh, representation, which means uh, we, we don't look at uh, reflections anymore, and then uh, we apply a yeah, just a uh, rotation invariant map, but uh, the reflection is still preserved there. And then uh, you see that the performance is uh, again good and even a little bit better than for uh, just having um, rotation act variance. So even if your task is on the global level or in the end not, uh, not invariant under a certain symmetry group, you can still have it in your first layers and then at the end restrict and uh, then just become invariant to a subgroup. Yeah. Yes, exactly. We, we have six layers and uh, we have five layers which are DN equivariant and the last convolution layer uh, kind of maps from a DN to a CN representation and kind of can, it, it can learn to uh, distinguish between reflections. So all layers up to that point cannot distinguish, but then the last layer can start seeing, oh, that's a reflected digit and classify it differently. Um, yeah, what was most interesting for us in this paper was uh, actually to, to benchmark different types of uh, symmetry groups and uh, different uh, group representations, uh, different types of nonlinearities and uh, these invariant maps which we apply at the end. Um, and yeah, so mostly we look at uh, reg regular representations, then we have uh, quotient representations, uh, irrep representations, and then other stuff like induced representations and uh, Gabriel came up with a whole family of, of uh, things you could do, uh, and we are benchmarking it. And uh, interestingly, we, we had before like uh, yeah a whole like the, the literature was really uh, dispersed about uh, rotation equivariant or, or in general affine group equivariant models. And uh, with this library, you can implement all of these models inside of one library. And we can even so may, maybe there was one paper which used only irreducible representations, then another paper used only regular representations. We can implement both, but we can even mix it. So uh, we can have a stack with multiple irreps, but then also regular representations in one layer. So it's kind of a unified uh, theory and implementation of all these uh, other papers which people are doing. Um, then what I want to show here is just uh, we can also use it to classify uh, uh, natural images which have uh, like a global gravity direction. So uh, rotations uh, you might think might not make sense. Uh, but um, we can again use this uh, group uh, restriction operation. And uh, then if we just take a uh, convolutional translation equivariant convolutional network baseline and uh, plug in our uh, dihedral group um, equivariant networks, uh, we get still a very high increase in performance. And we don't tune anything. We don't tune the hyperparameters, layers, uh, widths, and so on. We just plug it in and it works better since uh, we are exploiting these local symmetries. So uh, globally, these uh, images are aligned with an up-down direction, but locally you still have features like edges or so, which appear in all kinds of rotations and reflections, and our models can generalize uh, what they learned over these transformations. Uh, then just something, so we have many users of our library now, uh, there's one paper here, or many papers came, came out now which are uh, from reinforcement learning and they uh, kind of have these uh, robotic arms which uh, should do some tasks like uh, picking this block and putting it in a bowl and they do this with uh, reinforcement learning and uh, I think I cut off what it means these uh, uh, green blue and red curves but uh, the red curves uh, are basically the um, the uh, non equivariant models and then uh, the blue one is an equivariant model without uh, pre-training in the simulator and the green one is with pre-training but what you see is, uh, for instance, in the bottom right, in this uh, block in bowl task, uh, that the um, non equivariant model cannot even learn it. And uh, our, if they, they just take our equivariant models, and apparently it helps a lot. And another example from the literature uh, these guys uh, designed a convolutional Gaussian process. So they used our library to, to build a, a probabilistic model, and um, they wanted to design a probability distribution over vector fields. And um, how, how they did that was, uh, well, you, if you have your vector field, you have, uh, and, and you use this uh, standard Gaussian process assumption that you have uh, Gaussian distributions. 
uh, then you have a mean, which is just the vector field, tangent vector field, which you can predict with our library. And uh, then you also have a covariance field, the uncertainty for each vector prediction, uh, which is a symmetric tensor field, which again corresponds to a certain uh, combination of Arab fields. And uh, they just use our library to predict these fields, interpret it as a probability distribution. And uh, they find that uh, yeah, equivariance helps again. OK, so uh, I will now very shortly uh, say something uh, to group convolutional networks. Since uh, in the literature, there are, well, first we, we had these group convolutions uh, which appeared. And this is what most people use uh, in the 2D image processing uh, community. And we developed these uh, steerable CNNs and somehow the uh, 3D community uh, who are working on molecules and so on, they picked up that part. And these two communities uh, don't speak to each other and they don't understand their models. Uh, and <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, I want to explain how, how they relate to each other. Um, and I will also shortly say something in the end about uh, convolutions on homogeneous spaces, since uh, you can generalize whatever we did here now from Euclidean spaces to homogeneous spaces like spherical convolutions or something like that. Okay, so um, if, if you take a, a correlation or a G correlation, well, I, I talked about a group convolution, but uh, people call it group convolution, but then they do a group correlation. Uh, I think there's a one to one you can translate between these two things, but just to have that said, that uh, what I'm showing here are correlations. Um, yeah, you can think about a group correlation as a pattern matching with a G transformed uh, template kernel. And uh, I should say that, uh, well, with G, in this application, which we had, uh, I should have written the affine group of G. That's maybe a bit confusing. So think about an affine group uh, correlation here. And uh, yeah, we can motivate it uh, by the following. So if we have a convolution um, in R or for images on uh, RD, uh, we can think about it as taking a kernel and our uh, feature field or feature map, and then we apply this kernel. But uh, before we apply it, we uh, translate the kernel. Right, we have this weight sharing, so we have a translation T acting on the kernel, and then at this point where it is, it's being matched, which is an inner product. So you have uh, the translated kernel and uh, the feature map, and you take the inner product in RD, and uh, you get a response for each translation out. So uh, yeah, this uh, will be a, uh, what you get is a feature map on RD. This is just what you know, and uh, I suppressed the channel dimension here for simplicity. So you get one response for each position where you moved your kernel. Uh, but you could also uh, apply other symmetry groups to your kernel, for instance, the affine symmetry group. And then you don't only take your kernel and move it somewhere, you don't only translate it, but you can also rotate it. And uh, then you just have TG acting on your kernel. Uh, and at that point, and in that rotation or reflection or whatever, uh, you take the inner product with F uh, and the inner product uh, of functions on RD. And then you get a response for each position and each G transformation of your kernel. So you will get out a function on the affine group instead of a function on our Euclidean space. And um, yeah, here's an example for uh, G being uh, the cyclic group of order four. So we have rotations by 90 degrees. And um, we get responses here for like, the top and bottom uh, row here are two, two different kernels. So one detector for an eye and one detector for a mouth. And uh, we apply it at each point and in four different rotations. And this is uh, what I mean with having a feature map on the affine group. And our affine group here is now, it's a feature map on R2, but then we have four channels for the four rotations of the kernel, which you could apply. And now we can look at uh, how, how we process such feature maps on the affine group further. Um, the the uh, first idea which many people had was uh, just to do G pooling which means uh, you have these four uh, rotation channels, uh, for instance, and then you pool over these four uh, rotations. And uh, what you get is um, yeah, an, an invariant response, since uh, if you have feature at a certain position, uh, then if this feature rotates uh, and you apply these rotated kernels and pool over the responses, uh, you will get out an invariant response. Even if it's uh, equivariant here, here in the middle layer, you will in the end have something invariant. So uh, this operation maps back to scalar fields. And uh, we can look here at, um, oh yeah, and this, this notation here is uh, from an old paper. So uh, this capital Psi should be a kernel. So ignore that, please. Uh, but yeah, what you see here is uh, in the top, you have your image. And then you apply uh, these pattern detectors, the eye and the mouth feature in four uh, 
in four rotations. And you will detect here in the first rotation channel two eyes and a mouth. And now if you feed in a rotated image, then uh, you will get responses again. Uh, but now you get uh, responses in, in a cyclically shifted uh, channel, which corresponds to a rotated kernel. So this is the group action which you have here in this intermediate step. But then we pool here over, um, over these uh, rotation channels. And uh, what we get is uh, just here again, a rotation which acts like a scalar field. <laughs> and this looks nice since it's equivariant, but uh, it couldn't distinguish these two pictures from each other since um, you're really locally rotation invariant. And then uh, this looks like a valid uh, face picture to, to this algorithm since uh, it cannot distinguish the uh, rotation of the eye. It's just not encoded in the scalar value. You would need something like a, like a vector field or so. So what people use instead uh, are uh, G correlations, or I should have called it FG correlation, uh, which again just takes a kernel and now this feature map, which is living on the affine group, and the kernel is also a function on the affine group, and then uh, this kernel has a group action of the affine group, and again, you are just matching it, and uh, you get a response for each uh, affine group element, PG. So this uh, kind of maps such uh, feature maps on the affine group again to feature maps on the affine group in the most general way. And this is what uh, most, most people use. And you can chain these operations behind each other. So how, do, how does it relate to uh, steerable CNNs? Um, yeah, to, to see what is happening here, um, uh, we, we have that uh, these feature maps are functions on the affine group. And uh, topologically, you can think about this affine group as uh, just a direct product of uh, R2 and G. It's actually a trivial fiber bundle, um, which is how we would uh, generalize this further. But as, as a space, uh, as a topological space, the affine group just looks like R2 and then to each point uh, a fiber attached, which looks like G as a topological space. So if you would have uh, uh, G being SO2, you would have a circle at each point, for instance. And um, yeah, these functions on the affine group or functions on R2 times G can be thought of as functions which assign to each point in the base space, on the Euclidean space, a function on the group. So instead of having a scalar value to each point here in the total space of this trivial bundle, you would assign to each point only in the base space, on the Euclidean space, you would assign a function on this ray. And this is equivalent to each other. Um, yeah, and this function on array is a regular representation of this uh, group G. And um, yeah, so we, we can identify it as a, a steerable feature field of type rho regular. It's, it's just uh, how yeah, group convolutions, how, how they appear in our steerable convolutional networks. And uh, yeah, that's just a very intuitive uh, idea of what is going on there. You can actually prove that algebraically uh, more in, in a more, uh, yeah, in, in a more precise setting. Uh, and you would also have to check that the transformation laws are actually the same and not only that they are the same as vector spaces, but as representation spaces. And uh, yeah, so you see that uh, steerable CNNs uh, include these uh, group convolutional networks uh, as special cases if you take regular feature fields. Um, but we are more flexible in the sense that um, if you think about having here uh, some regular representation on G, you just have functions on the fibers. Um, for instance, if you have C4, you have these four orientations. For each of these four rotations, you would get the auto response. So I have a function on G. And uh, now we can look at the Fourier decomposition of these functions on G. Well, that's described by the Peter Weyer theorem. And you get some, yeah, this, this spectral decomposition. And this actually corresponds to the G irreps. So we take our regular representation of G, which is what, what group uh, convolutions do, and we decompose it into irreps subspaces. And uh, yeah, steerable CNNs can uh, directly address these uh, irrep subspaces and operate on these. So um, for instance, if you want to uh, have a scalar field, this corresponds uh, here to this trivial representation, which is a constant function. And you could encode it here as uh, a constant function on the G representation, but it's uh, less parameter efficient since you, you are only interested in this one subspace, but uh, in a group convolutional network, you have to embed this one dimensional subspace into an potentially infinite dimensional subspace. Or if you have something like vector field, it could be embedded in this uh, regular G representation, but uh, it corresponds actually to this frequency one 
uh, IREP subspace, and we can directly operate between these uh, subspaces. And not only, uh, yeah, not, not only the regular representation or uh, single IREP subspaces, but actually any representation and any rep or any unitary representation uh, is built out of such IREP subspaces. And uh, yeah, that's my last slide. Um, I just want to uh, give you an idea of how you can uh, generalize that uh, to um, general homogeneous spaces, which uh, if you remember, these were spaces with a transitive group action. For instance, our Euclidean space uh, is transitive under the uh, action of SE2, uh, which is an affine group with uh, SO2 as a stabilizer subgroup, um, or SO3 can be thought of as an SO2 bundle over S2. And uh, if you do a, a group convolution uh, here, let's say for SE2, then this would just mean that you take your kernel and you slide it everywhere and you apply it in every rotation. Um, and if you do it on, on, uh, on the sphere, then uh, you would have a kernel, let's say at the North Pole, and you want to be SL3 equivariant, so uh, you move it via SL3 to every single point. And um, yeah, these, these, yeah, you always have a point in your base space here. And then uh, at each point, each rotation, for instance, if G is SL2, again here, you, this SL3 rotation of your kernel would move your kernel to every point on the sphere and then apply it in every SL2 rotation at each point. And uh, then you get your regular representation, not only on, on Euclidean space, but also uh, on a sphere, or you can do it actually on any uh, homogeneous space. And uh, yeah, the G steerability here is actually a steerability with respect to the stabilizer subgroup of your, um, of your symmetry group, which acts on the homogeneous space. So for SO3, the stabilizer subgroup over S2 is SO2. And this is a non-trivial fiber bundle. And um, yeah, this is how we would view it from this uh, group convolution viewpoint. Um, but uh, the viewpoint of uh, Stereobusian ends just uh, takes or, or defines a convolution directly on the base space. So here it's R2, and there we would define a convolution on SO2, and then apply an uh, G steerable kernel or SO2 steerable kernel at each point. So if you want to uh, build a spherical CNN, you just take our SO2 steerable kernels, which you already saw, and you apply it at every point. And this is how these uh, two things relate to each other and can be generalized. And um, this actually does not generalize further to uh, Riemannian manifolds since uh, they, are, they, they are not uh, homogeneous spaces. But uh, with a different argument, uh, you will still um, come back to uh, this local G steerability. So it's again the same idea that at each point you apply a G steerable kernel. And uh, actually, I stole these uh, pictures from, from the talk, which I will give tomorrow. Uh, and, and these here are uh, frame bundles or sub bundles, G sub bundles uh, of the frame bundle. And this is how we will describe it there. Questions? <clears throat> yeah. You were showing uh, the very big table with results at some point. And I was wondering yeah. what kind of the you know, main takeaway from it, like basically what works best in, in practice. And I suppose, you know, maybe you can answer that question also more generally, because I like, feel like there's so many kind of options, you know, you kind of have to tackle this in that, you know, in your experience, what, what works best? Yeah, yeah. Um, so what works best uh, is actually regular representations. So <laughs> after all group uh, convolutions work best. Um, and uh, well, you could take uh, regular representations and decompose them in irrep subspaces. So like for representation theorists, they are linearly equivalent, right? You, you can, it's just a change of basis. And uh, we're looking at linear convolution operations, so that doesn't matter. But uh, actually the non-linearities don't uh, commute with this change of basis. And um, we think it depends uh, on the fact that on a regular representation, we can apply ReLUs. Since regular representations are permutation actions, and then, uh, yeah, permutations uh, commute with applying ReLUs. And uh, this is somehow what, what works best in practice. Yeah. But uh, it, it gets very high dimensional. So let's say you have uh, yeah, D8, the dihedral group of order eight, you have eight rotations and then two reflections. So you have 16 channels for one feature field. Uh, and that's still doable in two dimensions. But let's say uh, you are in 3D, then you have already a volumetric feature map. And then at each point, uh, well, SO3 is a continuous group, but uh, you would look at a discrete subgroup, let's say the icosahedral group, but that has already, uh, if you consider reflections and rotations, it would have uh, 120 elements. So it's volumetric and then 120 dimensional. 
uh, I guess you will see that as a standard approach in 10 years when we have terabytes of <laughs> GPU RAM. But uh, currently, people are using uh, ear apps uh, in 3D. So uh, you're talking about a pixelized discrete image, and then you have uh, a graph as a yeah. pixel grid on it. Okay. Yeah, I was just wondering if um, that is how it works. And uh... so our whole theory is uh, derived in continuous space, since then you have a larger symmetry group. And if you discretize it, uh, let's say, to a square pixel grid, uh, continuous rotations are not a symmetry anymore. Um, but uh, yeah, if if you have, let's say, a, square pixel grid graph, then uh, you still have asymmetries, uh, 90 degree rotations, for instance. And uh, in that sense, it's completely equivalent, but you lose these continuous symmetries. Okay. Is, is that answering your questions or yeah. did you? Yeah, yeah? okay. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, one, one more thing. Um, so if you have a standard graph uh, convolutional network, uh, it does not attend to directions and it's usually kind of invariant to uh, node permutations. So that would actually correspond to uh, um, to, to invariant kernels, like these frequency zero kernels, right? Which is uh, not very expressive, but uh, if you look at generalizations of graph networks, uh, like natural graph networks, which uh, Pim is the main author of, <laughs> he proved that these actually uh, recover our um, yeah group convolutions, I think, right? Yeah, yeah. so you would recover uh, dihedral group convolutions with 90 